I'm going to talk about the uh, economic impact of climate change. I'm going to say a few words about uh, super indicators, then I'm going to spend a considerable time uh, on methods for estimating the total welfare impact, a bit of detour uh, of evaluation, but I will be quick because we did that extensively last term, right? Um, I'm going to talk about the results, detour. Uh, over recent literature, climate uh, versus weather, and then a couple of social costs of carbon. Uh, what is not on this slide is the Viscusi Zeckhauser paper right, that you were supposed to have read. Um, this is where we are in the sequence. Um, so, next, next week, um, there won't be any lectures or seminars or anything. Uh, from me, uh, and then uh, we're going to return to uh, talk about climate and development. And then the week after, we're going to talk about optimal uh, emission reduction, and we're going to have a three week break, and then we're going to continue the discussion on cost benefit analysis uh, and optimal climate policy after uh, Easter. So, last week I spoke about the impacts of climate change from a health perspective, from a physical perspective, from a biological or an ecological perspective. Um, and what you've got there is that some of these impacts are small, some of these impacts are large, some of these impacts are positive, some of these impacts are negative, and it just all depends on what you care about, who you are, where you live, uh, and also uh, when you live uh, that tells you whether climate change would be a good thing or a bad thing but the impression you would get mostly from reading through this stuff uh, or listening to me talk about it is that it's just all very confusing um, so what we need to do in order to get a sense of uh, whether climate change is good or bad overall um, and whether or whether climate change is a big problem or a small problem uh, is to somehow aggregate this information into uh, so-called super indicators and you see five examples here um, and it just the reason that i put up uh, this uh, graph is also that it depends on what you care about uh, so here are five, four alternative super indicators. Um, if you are the sort of person who cares deeply about particular species or particular places, then climate change is enormous concern, right? So uh, on this axis, uh, on this graph, we're looking at various projections of climate change, and then here um, is an indication of how risky climate change would be according to four alternative uh, dimensions. And the color coding here is intuitive, that the redder uh, uh, the worse uh, it gets. Um, and in this particular column are the people who care about, say, atoll islands. And last week I talked about the islands may have are likely to disappear uh, under the sea by the end of this century. Half a meter, a meter above sea level uh, at the moment, um, and the freshwater uh, supply is threatened by saltwater intrusion. So, if you care about those places, then climate change is a big concern for you. Uh, if you care about uh, butterflies, then climate change is a big concern for you, because there have been documented uh, ex local extinctions uh, of butterfly species because of climate change in the recent past. And that is only going to get worse. Um, and it's not just butterflies, it's not just insects uh, that have already been reported to go extinct, but also a uh, little uh, rodent, a mouse in Australia has been recorded as going extinct because of warming. And that was only uh, last year that that happened. And the reason for that was that his mouse lives on a particular island and occupies a very specific ecological niche. 
the place warmed, things changed, and the mouse could not keep up. Right? So if that is your frame of mind, if that is what you are concerned about, then climate change is already a big problem, and it will only get worse. Right? Um, so that is what is going on here. Uh, if instead you say, well, extinctions happen all the time, places disappear, new places emerge, new species emerge, what do I care? Uh, I only care about big planetary changes. I only care about such things as the West Antarctic ice sheet sliding into sea, which would cause a sea level rise of uh, six, seven meters. Or I care about Greenland uh, melting, uh, which would add another eight meters uh, to sea level. Or I care about uh, the Fermat Halen circulation, the Gulf Stream. Uh, that keeps uh, on warm, uh, shutting down. I only care about those big planetary changes. Uh, then you are in this column. Uh, and then actually, climate change is not so much of a concern because those things will not happen this century and may not happen until the end of the millennium rather than the end of the century. So that's a long way into the future. Uh, and actually, for a lot of these things, you actually don't quite know what the relationship between, say, the stability of the West Antarctic ice sheet uh, and climate change is. <coughs> um, because it's a fairly complex thing. We know that the West Antarctic ice sheet occasionally disintegrates. It has done so in the past. There uh, are geological records of an ice tree um, uh, South Pole, um, but we don't quite know what climate change and therefore also not what greenhouse gas emission reduction would do to the probability of this thing happening. Because it's a very complex system, right? It's essentially the best Antarctic ice sheet is a big glacier. It's sort of driven partly by temperature, and if things warm up, then you would expect more calving, uh, but at the same time there's changes in snowfall over West Antarctica that also drive the system. Um, and at least as far as we know in the recent past, um, West Antarctica is act or Antarctica has actually been gaining ice rather than losing ice, uh, seems to be uh, the record. Um, one of the reasons why it is so very complicated to understand this is not just because it's a complex physical system, but also because a lot of the action of what is driving a glacier, what determines the fate uh, of a glacier, is happening at the bottom of the glacier, rather than at the top. The top is easy to observe, it's satellites, and you can send people um, there to see what's going on, but most of the action, the important action, is actually what is happening three kilometers below the surface of the ice, where the ice hits uh, uh, rock underneath, that is what essentially determines the fate uh, of a glacier. And we just can't observe that, right? It's basically guesswork uh, and uh, models. Um, but everything seems to suggest is that if you care about these things, then, well, perhaps you have other priorities and uh, other um, What I'm going to talk about Today is um, this particular column where we look at what does climate change do to the average welfare of a person. Uh, and then in two weeks' time, I'll talk about the distribution of those impacts as well. Right? <coughs> but, but what we see is that these different columns, these different super indicators, have different uh, color codings which suggests that the notion how much you should care about climate change really depends on your values and your attitudes. And there's no uh, objective answer <coughs> to it. Uh, but I'll be focusing on this column uh, today. And I'll be talking a lot about uh, this particular graph. Um, <coughs> what you see here uh, are estimates of the total um, the total economic impact of uh, climate change, rather the average economic impact of climate change. Um, the graph uh, works as follows. On the horizontal axis, we have 
indicators of the seriousness of climate change or the extent of climate change. So this is measured in uh, the change in the global mean surface air temperature since the industrial times. Uh, so zero means no change, we're back in 1750. Uh, and then the further to the right you move, the hotter it gets. Uh, this is not to say that we think that uh, the temperature is the only thing that matters, right? Rainfall and wind and everything matters too, uh, but this is just an indication of uh, the extent of climate change. Um, on the vertical axis, you're looking at the welfare equivalent income change. This is essentially the Hitchin equivalent variation. It says that if the world were to warm by two and a half degrees, then the average person on the planet would feel as if she had lost 1.3% of her income. Right? That is how you should read the uh, vertical axis. <coughs> and then the blue dots are the population of impact estimates. And if you count very quickly, you know that there's 27 of them. And that's all that has been published on the total economic impact, or the average economic impact of climate. Uh, and then the red curve is a curve that is fitted through uh, these uh, 27 points. So I'm going to be talking about this graph quite a lot. Uh, this is how to read it. The first question you may have is, <coughs> where does this come from? How did people actually derive uh, these estimates? Um, and the most common method is the so-called enumerative method designed by this guy here, uh, Ralph uh, Darch, who was also the first uh, to apply it um, to climate change. Darch is this point. Uh, this was back in the days that we worried about global cooling, mostly because of nuclear war. Um, and some background noise about uh, the ice age between. Um, so what do you do in the enumerative method? Essentially you do, you start by doing what I did last week. That is, you go through the long list of impacts of climate change and you read the scientific literature on this and the engineering literature and the economic literature on what are the impacts of climate change on crop growth, and what are the impacts of climate change on sea level and on coasts, and what are the impacts of climate change on human health, how many people will die prematurely. Um, so that is the first thing you do, you list all those impacts, you quantify all those impacts in their natural units. Um, then you estimate the price of these things, you multiply them and you add them up. Um, and for some of these things, this is relative. For some of these uh, price estimates, that's relatively straightforward. Um, if, for instance, you say, "Well, sea level rise is going to threaten London. What are we going to do about it? We can give up London, but that is going to cost us a few trillion dollars." Uh, so perhaps we want to protect London, and then the question is, how do you best do that? Well, you kind of replace, because the issue in London is not so much permanent inundation, but more uh, storm surges. Um, <coughs> so, the, so you have temporary flooding rather than permanent flooding uh, in a place like London. Uh, so you want something like the Thames barrier to protect London. Uh, okay, to leave the problem with the current Thames barrier, is A, it's getting old, and but more importantly, it's not big enough. It's not high enough. It was built way back when, when sea level rise was not a concern, and if sea level rises, if storm gets more violent, um, then you would expect the London barrier to be overtopped um, and not be able to protect London anymore. So what you have to do is replace the Thames barrier by something bigger. And then the question is, what will that cost? And what you do is call up a few engineering companies and say, what would this cost? And that is how you would determine the price, right? Um, 
Similarly, if you look in uh, agriculture, you wonder um, what would it cost if uh, wheat yields would reduce by 20%. According to this method, you actually ignore such things as pricing decisions and everything. You just look at a quantity shop, you look at the price shop, so you just go into a website that will give you the price of wheat. And then you say 30% loss at the price of one dollar per bushel would give me a clue what we will cost. Uh, what we cost at the moment. Um, you multiply the two and that's your cost estimate, right? Uh, but things of course get more problematic if we're talking about health, if we're talking about nature. And last week I indicated that that is actually uh, terribly important. Okay. So for those issues, we use monetary valuation uh, methods. And Last term, I spent three weeks on this, so I'm going <laughs> to give you the rundown now uh, very, very quickly, right? So <coughs> what do you do to uh, value nature? Uh, well, the preferred method is to look at revealed references where um, the prices are sort of a uh, hypothetical market or a related, sorry, a related market for things that are going on uh, in nature. So if you want to value uh, a beach, you can use the travel bug method where the time and money that people spend to go to the beach essentially functions as an entrance fee to that beach, right? And therefore, you can uh, come up with a uh, demand curve for the value the recreation value of that particular piece. Uh, so that is one way of doing this. Uh, another way uh, of doing this is looking um, not at household production, but at household consumption, so what we call a pricing method, where you compare systematically the prices of houses that sit in nice environments versus the price of houses that sit in ugly environments. And the price difference is then again can be interpreted as a demand function for living in a nice environment, right? Um, you provided that you sort of understand your data, you're a good econometrician, and you understand all the other issues that may reflect the price of houses or uh, the demand for recreation. Uh, this is a relatively reliable method uh, for estimating the value of things. Big problem with revealed preference methods is that they measure direct use value only. You buy a house in a nice environment to enjoy the nice environment, not because of the existence value of uh, the wombat, for instance. That is not why you buy a house. Um, wombats are actually not threatened, so uh, <laughs> don't worry about it. Um, um, If you want to also value those things that are not direct use values, you want to measure uh, people's preferences for the fact that there's whales swimming out in the ocean, um, you need to move to so-called safer preference methods, uh, which used to be dominated by continuous evaluation, where essentially you ask people how much are you willing to pay to help protect the whale. Um, but nowadays, most of these studies are contingent choice, where you present people with different scenarios that differ in their in the number of whales that are out there, but also differ in uh, the amount of money that they have or the amount of money that they spent. Uh, so it's a contingent choice method, uh, and then you can use the answers to these values again to derive a demand function for, in this case, the protection of. Uh, whales. Um, the good thing about the safe preference methods is that you can apply them to anything. The bad thing about safe preference methods is that people may not have well-formed preferences for these things because it's an unusual uh, question to ask. Uh, it may be um, that people will try and manipulate the answer 
it may be that people um, respond to the interviewer or the questionnaire in a way that is not anticipated by uh, the design, right? Uh, and all sorts of things uh, can go wrong. And we talked about it uh, last uh, term. But unfortunately, this is the only uh, way to get uh, many uh, values that are important. Um, now, last term, I also talked about uh, the difference between willingness to pay and willingness to accept compensation or equivalent uh, variation and compensating variation. Those terms were, of course, introduced by John Hicks, who you see here. Um, and what I said then was the willingness to pay is essentially your supermarket scenario where you go and buy stuff. And how much are you willing to pay for a pint of milk? Um, and willingness to accept compensation is staying with the supermarket. You walk out of the supermarket with your pint of milk. Somebody walks into you, knocks the milk out of your hand, and it spills all over the pavement. And how much compensation would you ask for this pint of milk? Right? Um, to um, make you equally uh, well off again. Um, now, <coughs> Robert Willey uh, in, uh, that's quite a while ago, uh, in 76 uh, wrote a paper that showed that the consumer surplus, or the change in consumer surplus rather, lies strictly in between the equivalent variation and the compensating variation. Um, and this is because of the income effect, because your willingness to pay your equivalent variation is partly determined by your budget constraints. You cannot pay more for a pint of milk than the money that you have, right? Um, whereas the compensating variation is not constrained by this. There's no opportunity cost. The opportunity because somebody is giving you money. So if there is a budget constraint, then it is essentially um, their budget rather than your budget. And because of that, the compensating variation is always greater than the consumer surplus is always greater than the equivalent variation. Uh, but as you can imagine, a pint of milk is not particularly expensive relative to your income. And therefore, we have also show that in most cases, these three measures should be approximately equal to each other. Um, and then I showed you this graph uh, last term, where there were experimental measures and survey measures of willingness to pay and willingness to accept compensation for the same goods. And we look for that there could be good. Uh, that the ratio of these two should be one. And a large number of studies show that that is not the case. That typically what we find is that the willingness to accept compensation is much larger than the willingness to accept and uh, than the willingness to pay. And this goes for big things, big items, but it also holds for small items like Mars bars or coffee cups, um, which all of a sudden become three times as expensive if somebody takes it away from you rather than if you just bought it. <coughs> um, and the reason for that, uh, I argued uh, last term, is it's not just a budget constraint that is different, uh, but there's also differences between voluntary and involuntary risks. And the example I always give is losing your leg in an accident. And if it's because of you are your drive, drunk driving, and you get yourself into an accident, you lose your leg, that is bad, but not nearly as bad as if I am drunk driving and get you into an accident and you lose your leg, right? The two are not the same. Subjectively, even though objectively, you have lost your leg, right? Uh, so that is one reason why the two uh, are different. And other uh, is more behavioral uh, economics types of stuff that there is a status quo bias. That people are attached to the way things are. And in willingness to pay, essentially, you expand the way things are. And that's uh, voluntary, and it doesn't really matter. Whereas willingness to accept compensation, you lose something that you have. And people uh, respond uh, to that. 
right? Uh, so this is all a uh, repetition of where we were uh, last term. I repeat this because it's particularly relevant for climate change, right? So willingness to pay is essentially us buying what we think is a better climate for our children and grandchildren. Right? Whereas the willingness to accept compensation scenario is their willingness to be compensated for us imposing the worst climate on them. Right? And a willingness to pay, a willingness to accept compensation, so willingness to pay for a one degree cooler climate in the future versus willingness to accept compensation, willingness to pay for one degree cooler climate in the future versus willingness to accept compensation for a one degree warmer climate in the future. The two are different, right? The willingness to accept compensation and willingness to pay were the same, then the answer to these two questions would be the same. But if they're not, the way you phrase climate policy makes a difference, may make a big difference. Right? Um, and it's not just the budget constraint uh, that is different here, uh, because presumably our children and grandchildren will have different incomes than we do, um, but it's also the voluntary and involuntary risks that are different. Right? Because climate change is not something that happened that we do to ourselves, because of the long delays in particularly the ocean, Climate is something that is imposed on you by your forebears. So it's an involuntary risk. Right? Um, and if we accept that that is one of the main drivers between equivalent and compensating variation, then we should expect these two measures to give very different answers um, in a question about climate policy. Now, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Another thing to note is that the 27 estimates that I've just showed you all assume willingness to pay. Right? That is the frame of mind, the frame, uh, the, the way climate policy is framed in this literature. We're going to buy a better climate for our children and grandchildren. Um, Now, one thing I did not talk about uh, last term is so-called benefit uh, transfer. <coughs> what I uh, did speak about is the difficulties with monetary valuation. To get this right is hard, uh, and therefore it's expensive to do these things. So a simple, uh, straightforward, not a pricing study is something that would occupy a junior researcher by a year or so. Uh, so the cost, if the data are free, easily come up to 50,000 pounds or so for a single estimate, right? Uh, if you're talking about contingent valuation or contingent choice studies, it's harder. You need bigger samples to get it up to uh, state of the art, you're easily talking about 150,000 pounds per estimate, right? So this is expensive, and the reason it's expensive is because you need to do primary data collection, you need to have a, a good economic ratio uh, to get it right, and those things cost money. Um, because of that, the number of estimates is limited and it's measured in the, f I think it's measured in the low 10,000s. Um, and that means that we know, and <laughs> academics are academics, right? Um, so it is much easier to publish a study like this if you go back to an area that had been studied before so that you can show that your new fancy method is 
different and argue that it's better than previous methods applied to the same thing. If you go off and study something new, then there's nothing to compare your estimates to, right? So you have absolutely no frame to say, well, mine is better, right? Because yours is new, right? And therefore, it's the best estimate uh, for this particular plate. Um, so because of this, we actually have estimates of the value of a fairly limited number of things. Um, but that is not what we want for climate change. Right? What we want is the value of everything, because, as I argued last week, climate change will affect essentially everything. So we need to know the value of all species and of all nature reserves, and we need to know the value of all health impacts. <coughs> um, and therefore we need to extrapolate from what we know to the things we want to know. Um, and that climate change is another important issue, namely, that the impacts we are talking about are impacts in the future. We are not so much interested in the value of climate change in the past or today. No, we're interested in the value of climate change in 2050 and in 2100 and perhaps beyond that. Uh, and there's just no way you can observe that, right? Um, so what we need is extrapolation from the things that we know to the things that we need to know, both spatially and temporally. Um, so that's what we need to do. And this is known in the literature as benefit transfer. But it's essentially extrapolation. Right? Um, the problem with benefit transfer is that it is difficult. Uh, and I'll give you two examples. Um, and the first is shown here. Um, <coughs> So this is work done by uh, Marianne Sanderson. Um, and what she did uh, was that she uncovered a travel survey in Denmark. And that is done every 20 years. Now this is somewhat older work. Uh, so she had the travel survey of 1977 and the travel survey of 1997. And presumably there's a travel survey in 2017 as well, but this is work that predates 2017. Um, so it's a travel survey, it's a very detailed survey, it asks, interviews people uh, who went and visit forests in Denmark, and it asks them, how did you come here, how much time did you spend, how much money did you spend, why are you here, uh, is this for health reasons, or are you walking your dog, or are you entertaining your children? Um, all those sort of questions. Uh, and then from that, she estimated uh, demand function based on the travel cost method, um, and then derived the value of these 58 forests, right? So something you learned today, there are 58 forests in Denmark. And uh, this is a population, this is not a sample. So that is the first thing she did, and she did so for 1977 and for 1997. Um, and then what she did was she used the 1977 results to predict what the value would be in 1997 and compare that to the estimate for 1997. Um, and the difference between, or rather the ratio between the two, are the black triangles, right? So the question was, based on 1977 information, how good are we at predicting the value of the forest in 1997? And you can see that she got some forests right, and the forecast error was a few percent, and she got some forests spectacularly wrong, right? Where the forecast error was up to 750%. Ouch. Right? And it is not because Mariana doesn't know what she's doing, right? Yeah, she's very terrible. Um, and then she cheated. And she said, well, let's 
introduced changes in car ownership between 77 and 97 and changes in family structure and changes in income into my equations. So she observed, she perfectly predicted family composition in 1997 by using information from the future essentially. Um, we did the exercise and then we are sort of in the gray uh, squares, right? And even if you observe correctly all or predict correctly all the other changes that happen in daily society, you still get errors up to 400%, right? Now, this is the easy one, right? Denmark is a very stable, very slowly changing society. Nothing ever happened in Denmark, right? And it's only 20 years. And for climate change, of course, what we need to do is do this for a country like Nigeria or Pakistan over 100 years, right? Where things change much more rapidly than they do in Denmark. <coughs> um, so this is uh, benefit transfer over time. Uh, these are examples of benefit transfer over space. Uh, and it's all done in the US where they estimated the value of uh, fishing in one lake and in the lake next door. And then they use the one lake to predict the value of fishing uh, in the lake next door compared it to the observed value and how wrong did they get it. Uh, water quality improvements of one river uh, compared to a river uh, just a little bit further north or east. Um, same for uh, sea fishing, same for uh, rafting, um, and so on and so forth. And these are relatively simple things. This was typically done within a state in the US, so relatively close areas. And you see that sometimes they get it roughly right. Um, but the errors introduced go up to, again, a factor of five, right? And again, these are relatively simple issues where you take uh, one river and you predict uh, the value of the river next door. Uh, but of course, because these valuation studies are very heavily concentrated in the US and in the UK and in Canada, what we need to do is take the value of that. Uh, forest in Denmark and based on that predict the value of a forest in Congo. Right? That's the sort of challenge uh, that we are after and what you see is that the errors introduced are just enormous <coughs> and unknown, right? Uh, we know that it's wrong but uh, we don't know. Um, what to do. So that's the enumerative method, right? So you quantify the impacts with all the uncertainties attached, you estimate their price with all the <coughs> uncertainties attached, you multiply the two, you add them up. One main drawback of the enumerative method, I don't know why I didn't try it was here yet, um, is that you ignore the market and you ignore basic partial equilibrium. That if the supply of wheat falls, and you would expect that the price of wheat changes too, right? Um, and that is typically uh, not included. Uh, so another group of estimates uses not just the partial equilibrium, but actually uses general equilibrium. So the method is very much the same. You take those physical impact uh, estimates, you use that to what CG models call uh, shock uh, the model, and then you estimate the welfare change. So the good thing about this method, well, there's a couple of good things about this method, is that it doesn't just take into account the partial equilibrium. <laughs> that is, if the supply of wheat falls, then the price of wheat will change too. So that is uh, into this, uh, baked into this model. Uh, but also what you would have in this model is 
price of wheat goes up, then people will substitute to buy, say, to feed themselves. Uh, so you would see the demand for other goods, in this case other foodstuffs, go up, right? Because people want uh, to have a certain amount of calories um, uh, intake. Uh, so you see the substitution going on on the demand side, on the consumer side, but you also see substitution going on on the supply side because the wheat farmers are not just going to give up and uh, give their market to the competition. No, they're going to compensate by putting more fertilizers on, by perhaps hiring uh, more workers to work their fields harder, uh, to keep uh, their yields uh, up. And that, of course, implies changes in input markets into agriculture, both in terms of intermediates, fertilizers, but also in terms of the labor market. And of course, if there's more people working in wheat fields, that means that there's fewer people available for to work other stuff. So all those things are included in a general equilibrium model, and not just within an economy, but it also includes all the interactions between economies. Right. <coughs> um, so that is how you should uh, pick things. And you also see changes in international trade patterns uh, as a result of uh, climate change. And all that is taken into account. So this is much more sophisticated in terms of how markets respond uh, to changes. Um, a good thing about people's general equilibrium models is also that they are micro-consistent. So the welfare measure that you get out is the proper Hicksian equivalent variation, right? As envisaged by uh, Hicks, not some sort of approximation uh, to this. No, this is a proper uh, welfare measure. Um, the bad thing about computer general equilibrium models is that they are based on the national accounts. That is where the data come from. And that implies that everything that is not in the national accounts is not in a general equilibrium model. So subsistence agriculture, forget it, right? Um, cleaning your own house, forget it. That's not in the computer general equilibrium model, right? Uh, leisure, unless it is going out and buying a ticket to the cinema, is not in uh, a computer general equilibrium. So if you enjoy yourself by playing football in the park, that's not in a CG, right? It's only when there's a market transaction that it pops up in the national accounts and therefore in the computer general equilibrium. Um, health impacts, what you would see in a CG is people going to the doctor. It actually increases GDP, right? Because there's all sorts of economic transactions going on. People buying medicine, right? That increases GDP. So that is in there. But not you feeling sick. That is not in a CT, right? Uh, so yes, it has its advantages. No, it has uh, its great disadvantages as well. Um, and now Ricardo should be shown. Uh, what other people have done is use statistical methods where essentially they estimate the relationship between an economic activity and the climate. Um, <coughs> now this goes back to Ricardo. We didn't just do trade, we did many other things. Um, and Ricardo noted that if you buy a piece of land, you do not just buy that land, but you also buy the property right to all future sun that will shine on that land and all future rain that will fall on that land. Right? That is implicitly yours as well. Which means that those climate values, the geographical values, you buy a piece of land close to London, you also buy the distance to London, right? Um, and Ricardo argued that all those factors, those environmental factors, are uh, capitalized in the value of the land, right? 
Um, so what people have done, and the, the, the first study was done by uh, Rob Mendelson of Yale, um, is they regressed the value of agricultural land on everything that determines that value, including the rain that falls on the land, the sun that shines on that land, right? and the temperature and so on and so forth. Um, and what they found is a very nice relationship that it can be too cold for agriculture, it can be uh, too hot for agriculture, and in between there is sort of a climate uh, optimum. So they estimated the relationship over space, because and this was done for the United States, uh, because you have a wide variation of rainfall uh, from fairly wet to very, very dry, from fairly cold uh, in Maine uh, to fairly hot in Florida. Uh, so we have a wide variety of climates in the US. You have well-observed agri agricultural markets, so you run a regression of one on the other, and you find this uh, nice relationship. And that tells you how climate affects agricultural land markets today, or rather in the recent past, and then they made a deep of faith and assumed that this relationship holds over time as well. And then they simply project the future climate onto the current relationship and say, well, this is how things are going to change. Um, the good thing about this is that we don't need to make assumptions about how farmers will adapt to climate change because we observe how farmers have adapted to climate change. Right? All that is included uh, in the estimated relationship. So that is a good thing. Um, bad thing about this method is that you assume that a relationship that is observed over space holds over time. And if you take the Atlantic seaboard uh, of the US as an example, what you see is that people in Florida grow citrus, oranges and those sort of things, which are very valuable. Uh, people up in Maine grow wheat, because essentially that's the only thing that grows there. Um, and then when you use this, project this into the future, what you see is that more and more people are growing oranges and fewer and fewer people growing wheat, right? But because an orange grove is much more valuable uh, than a wheat field, you would see an increase in the value of land because more and more people are growing oranges. And it completely ignores the fact that, yeah, a balanced diet has a lot of wheat in, a lot of bread and a lot of pasta and those sort of things. And yeah, oranges are good for you, but they can't sustain you, right? So those demand side effects are simply not there. Uh, what this also assumes is, yeah, the, what allows people in Florida to concentrate on oranges and people in Maine to concentrate on wheat. Of course, it's not that people in Maine only eat wheat and people in Florida only eat oranges. What you see is lots of trucks going up and down the Atlantic seaboard, shipping wheat from Maine to Florida and oranges from Florida to Maine. So the implicit assumption in this study is that it is just as easy to ship food over time as it is over space. That's not true, right? It's easy to drive a truck from Florida to Maine. It is not easy to drive a truck from 2020 to 2030, right? Uh, and you can store oranges only for a limited amount of time. Um, and then thirdly, the good thing about doing this for the US is that international trade policy is the same for everyone. A lot of technologies available are the same for everyone. So those things are constant and therefore do not affect your relationship. But the implicit assumption is that those things do not affect the relationship between agriculture and climate. And what we have seen in the past, throughout the past, as uh, far as we've observed it, is the technological progress in agriculture is mostly focused on making marginal lands 
unproductive lands productive. Um, and that would completely change the relationship between climate uh, and weather. Um, <coughs> and of course, trade allows farmers to focus on those things that are their comparative advantage. And if there's no trade, you need to produce for the local demands. And therefore, you kind of grow all sorts of things that don't really grow that well in where you are for the soils that you have, for the climate that you have. Whereas, if there's cheap shipping of agricultural stuff, then you kind of focus on those things that grow well on your fields, right? Uh, so, if you have um, trade restrictions, being introduced, like uh, Trump is doing and uh, Johnson are doing at the moment, you would actually expect the value of agricultural land to fall, and particularly in those areas where people are forced to grow things to feed the local market, and grow things that don't grow uh, particularly well. Um, so there's good things about this method, but there's bad things about this method too. Uh, what people have also done is just directly estimate the relationship between self-reported well-being uh, and climate. <coughs> um, and then finally, what people have done uh, is there's two studies, one published, uh, where they just ask people, what do you think the impact of climate change would be? Um, the big problem with the uh, only published study was that it was done in 1994 when the people who were asked to give their expertise could not reasonably claim to know anything about uh, this area at all. Um, so uh, that is what we have. <coughs> These are the 27 estimates. Uh, the good thing is that even though these methods all have their pros and cons, they actually give roughly the same answer. They don't come up with completely different results. So even, you, even though you can pick apart um, any uh, of the 27 dots as having severe drawbacks, the fact that those drawbacks are different between methods, but you get roughly the same results, suggest that these results are not completely uh, completely off the wall. Um, what are these results? Um, initial warming may be beneficial. Why is that? Warmer winters mean less money spent on heating your home, that's a positive. Uh, warmer winters mean less uh, cold-related deaths, particularly flu. Um, and of course the driver is CO2, for the, uh, CO2, uh, CO, more CO2 in the atmosphere, which makes plants grow faster and more drought resistant, right? So those are the initial uh, benefits. So the initial benefits quickly disappear and the negatives of climate change start to uh, dominate fairly uh, rapidly. This, these estimates are relative to pre-industrial times, and we have already seen roughly one degree of warming. So the initially positive impacts are actually in the past, and the ones that are still somewhat in the future are some benefits because regardless of what we do with our emissions, if we just stop greenhouse gas emissions now, the world will warm by another half a degree, maybe a degree. So it's only beyond this point or so that we can start influencing the climate. Right? Um, <coughs> so whatever is happening here, those initially positive impacts are uh, sunk in the sense that they're not affected by whatever decision you make. <coughs> so that is uh, the first thing you observe. Um, and of course, things get progressively worse uh, as the world warms uh, further. Um, 
the uh, second thing you observe is the order of magnitude, which is relatively small. Essentially, this says that two and a half degrees of warming is roughly equivalent to losing 1.3% 1 1 of your income. Now, two and a half degrees of warming is something that we can expect in 60 years' time or so. So another way of phrasing this is that a century of climate change is about, is about as bad as losing one year of economic growth. That's the order of magnitude that we're talking about. It suggests that climate change is a problem, but not the biggest problem of humankind, right? In the financial crisis, the Eurozone crisis, the Greeks lost a third of their income on average in five-year periods, which is bigger than 1% in 100 years' time, right? And if you ask the people in Syria, would you not rather have the problems of Greece? They would happily agree with you, right? That they would rather lose a third of their income in five years' time than having Assad and Putin and now Erdogan uh, imposed on them, right? <coughs> so climate change is not the biggest problem of humankind. It's also, by the way, not the biggest environmental problem of humankind. I'll talk about it in two weeks' time. Uh, the projected death toll of climate change is about a million deaths uh, around the year 2100. You would say, well, a million deaths is a million too many, right? And I would completely agree with you. Uh, but uh, indoor and outdoor air pollution kills between 6 and 8 million people per year now, in 2020. And I would argue that 7 million in 2020 is more important than 1 million in 2100, right? So climate change is also not the biggest environmental problem of humankind. Not to say that it's not a problem, it's just that it's, it's not. Uh, nearly as high as it's a priority <coughs> um, The final thing I want to say about the results is that there is a large uncertainty about this, as you may have guessed from everything I've told you uh, so far, uh, but also that the uncertainty is asymmetric in the sense that positive surprises are much less likely than negative surprises of uh, equal but opposite magnitude. Um, <coughs> so nobody has predicted that because of climate change we all will become basically happy. Right? So that the most optimistic projection of what climate change will do to us is that it won't do very much. Whereas scare stories about climate change are actually fairly easy to come by. Right? Uh, and of course, the, the best prediction uh, ever, uh, I think, of climate change is that the Earth is going to explode. Won't happen, uh, but it has been predicted. Um, of course, we have Extinction Rebellion going around saying that humankind will go extinct, right? No. Uh, we have clowns like Johan Rukstrom uh, going around saying climate change will kill uh, 7 billion people. Not quite all of them, but almost all of them. Uh, that's not going to happen, but there can be truly scary things uh, going on. <coughs> and uh, one example that will take me uh, the minutes that I've left before the break is what happens to the permafrost? So a lot of area, in, particularly in Canada and in Siberia, is permanently frozen. And if it warms up, then a number of things will happen. One is that your ice roads will disappear. All the buildings that were put up, assuming that the ground is permanently frozen, will collapse, right? The foundations will simply uh, fall. Um, pipelines will start breaking, right? So that is pretty serious and uh, it's, it's fairly expensive to repair all that, but fortunately there's not a whole lot of stuff out there. Um, Another thing that will happen in the permafrost melts is that it essentially turns into the swamp, so you have massive uh, methane emissions from that, uh, because all that stuff 
all that organic stuff that is now frozen will start to rot, right? Um, but uh, most scary of all, we don't know what will be unfrozen. And there is reason to suspect that there's all sorts of viruses frozen in the permafrost that will become unfrozen. And we don't know what it's going to do with it. We do know that viruses can survive in frozen states for very long periods of time. So, yes, <laughs> the frost did not kill them. Uh, of that we can be pretty sure. And most of these viruses will be perfectly innocent, right? But perhaps there is something like smallpox in there that will be released. We just don't know. And should something like smallpox be unreleased, I mean, your great-grandparents had some immunity against uh, smallpox, but you don't. <laughs> you have zero immunity, and this is a killer, right? Um, forget about corona. <laughs> if smallpox or something like smallpox gets out, then you are dead, right? Uh, chances are uh, that all of us will die. Um, not all of us, but definitely everybody, most likely everybody too. And so it's very, you can come up with these scenarios of climate change doing really dramatic damage. You can't exclude it. You can't say this is impossible. We don't, haven't got a clue what the probability of these things are, but we can't exclude uh, these things. And that is why the uh, lower bounds of the impacts is much further away from the central estimates than the upper boundaries. So I've said most things I want to say about this graph and what it means, uh, except for one thing. Um, and I've also discussed most of the uh, caveats. Um, no, that's it. Uh, the interactions are uh, sometimes ignored. Uh, for instance, in the uh, enumerative method, people estimate the impact of climate change on agriculture, and then they estimate the impact of climate change on water resources, and add them up, completely ignoring that around 70-80% of fresh water used is in agriculture. Um, so there's issues that we talk about adaptation at length, we talk about a lot of the high impact. Uh, what people also ignore is knock-on effects on economic growth, uh, for instance. Um, so there's all sorts of issues uh, that are addressed imperfectly, uh, which means that these numbers have to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, the thing that uh, I did not mention is that all published assessments so far are incomplete. That is, they look at a subset of the impacts of climate change. And one thing that is typically missing is the impact of climate change on transport. So what you've noticed, uh, you travel around uh, Sussex, is that because of the rains, there's lots of potholes. And that means that in the future, road repairs will cost a different amount uh, than they do now. That's not included, because uh, we haven't, simply nobody's done it yet. Um, <coughs> that's probably a small thing. Uh, but there's also nothing there is tourism. So people go to Spain because the weather is nice. Uh, but in the future, Spain may be too hot, and they may go to Germany instead. And uh, these are big things. So we often talk about health as if it is one of the largest sectors in the economy. We spend around 8 9% of our income on health care. We spend around 10 12% of our income on recreation, leisure, and tourism. Some of that stuff is completely unaffected by climate change. All the money you spend on games on your mobile phone, that's included in that percentage, but that is not, not affected by climate change, but your main summer holiday or your skiing holiday is affected by climate change, right? 
uh, and it's not yet in these estimates. So um, do take these numbers with the required caution and caveats, right? Um, <coughs> now, I have three more things uh, I want to say. What I said is that these blue dots are the published estimates on the impact of climate change. Um, in the airwaves and on the internet, um, there are other studies uh, that are highlighted that I don't think are impact assessments of climate change, they are impact assessments uh, of something else. And uh, one particularly famous uh, study is by these three gentlemen, uh, Berkey, Xiang, and Miguel, that is much more severe in its impact uh, than a lot of the other things uh, that we have seen, and this of course is particularly beloved by uh, environmentalists, right? You're going to say, oh, well, climate change is going to ruin us all. <coughs> um, and in the last couple of months, these two gentlemen, Matt Khan and Ken Mohades, um, have published a study that was basically splashed all over the media. Um, and they come with a much more uh, decent range, much more reasonable range, I think, uh, in the gray area here that shows you what is the impact um, of climate change on uh, human uh, welfare. The reason that I think uh, that these studies are not studies of the impacts of climate change is the methods uh, that they use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There aren't that many faults around. Uh, there, are, there are a good few, but they typically work in other fields. That's um, energy use in winter, cold related deaths, and CO2 footprint deaths. Um, so, uh, <coughs> what these, these, these people have realized is uh, the, 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 the more recent studies are all uh, empirical studies. Um, what these people have realized is that if you take these Ricardian studies, it's not just that you, s you measure something over space and then you assume that it holds over time, which is problematic, but they also notice that climate varies slowly over space climate here is different than the climate in Scotland, but it's not wildly different, right? Um, and if you want to look at a completely different climate, then you need to go to Spain or Italy or Greece or uh, Morocco further south, right? And then it's not just that the climate is different in Morocco than it is in the UK, but everything is different, right? institutions are different, technology is different. Um, so you have the climate varies only slowly over time and the climate is confounded with all sorts of everything. Some of it is measurable, other things are not measurable, right? Um, so it's actually very hard to put much confidence in these statistical studies. So what people have done recently is say, is that a question? <coughs> yeah, that's not very precise. Okay. <laughs> you got two papers. You got the. I, was the no, I did not write just two papers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 1995 to 2002. Yeah. Well, they're also at different points in the future, right? For different scenarios of climate change. So we could actually draw a curve for that and then it would be perfectly consistent with each other. But I mean, essentially, I redid everything in 2002 relative to 1995. So they predict different lengths of time into the future. Yes. Does that, would that make them all the studies like that? It, I mean, they are put at different intensities of climate change, right? But if, uh, if say, your 2002 one is predicting 30 years into the future, and yet another one is predicting 100 years into the future, does that make them? Make them completely really incomparable. Yeah, comparable. Uh, but this is comparative static, right? <coughs> So the only thing that is assumed to change here uh, is the climate. Population, economy, technology, everything is kept constant. I'll come back to that in two years. Now. 
so in that sense, they're compar comparable. But yeah, they, they had, you should not have put this up, right? Uh, <laughs> the big difference between this study and this study is that all the data are different. Essentially, it's a complete rework of uh, the previous one. Um, right. Um, where was I? Uh, so it's difficult to estimate the relationship uh, between economic activity and climate because of confounders, right? Climate changes slowly over sp uh, space and slowly over time, and everything else changes as well. So what a number of people have done is estimate the impact of weather on economic activity. And the good thing about this, econometrically, is that you have a lot of weather shocks, uh, and you have cold winters and warm winters and warm summers and cold summers and wet summers and dry summers, all happening within a relatively, um, relatively short period. So you have a lot of variation. You also have a lot of variation over space. Uh, because it's much wetter in Wales at the moment than it is uh, here, right? Whereas a few years ago, it was actually the opposite, that the floods were more concentrated in this part of the country than in that part of the country. So you have a lot of variation over time and over space. Um, so that's a good thing. Another good thing uh, is that what happens to the weather is essentially completely random from an economic or it's not random from a physical perspective, and from an economic perspective, it is random. Uh, so you have a lot of shocks that are random, so you can, with great confidence, estimate the impact of weather on economic activity. And people have done that, and they've done so repeatedly. They've looked at GDP, they've looked at trade patterns, they've looked at particular economic outcomes, uh, some broad, like GDP, as I said, but also some very narrow, as how do pear pickers perform in hot, on hot and cold days. So there's a, a, by now an enormous literature uh, on this. And then, of course, the assumption is that whatever happens to pear pickers in California is representative uh, to what happens to every worker uh, across the planet. Um, the problem with these studies, and that's why I excluded them, is that weather shocks are not climate shocks. And they're completely different. Um, <coughs> and uh, the reason that it's very, very different is goes back to what is the difference between weather and climate. And as meteorologists uh, like to say, uh, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. Right? Um, So one is sort of the long term, and the other is the very short run. And because one is, or and another way uh, people have phrased it, is that weather throws the punches, but climate trains the boxer. Or weather is your mood, climate is your personality. Um, or if you don't like the weather, wait, right? Because it will be different in a few hours' time. Uh, but if you don't like the climate in the place that you are, the only way to solve it is to move to another place, right? Um, and that means that the way we respond to weather is completely different than the way we respond to climate. Uh, so the response to rain is to put up your umbrella, right? Whereas the response to the chance of rain, that is the climate, is to buy an umbrella. Now, those are trivial things. The response to a flood is to close the floodgates. But the response to the risk of flood, that is uh, climate, is to build the floodgates. Right? Um, so essentially, if you estimate the relationship between economic activity and weather, you're estimating short-term elasticity. Everything is the same. Your technology is the same. Your capital stock is the same. The composition of your economic activity is the same. And the only thing that is different is the weather. Um, whereas with climate, you have the chance to reinvest in new things. You have the chance to change what, how you make your living. You have the chance to invent new technologies. 
and therefore the two elasticities are very, very uh, different. Um, <coughs> and therefore I don't think you can extrapolate from the short-term elasticity to the long-term elasticity. And then there is the another problem, and that is that um, expectations are very different, right? So weather just hits you, there's nothing you can do. Um, but climate is something that changes very slowly and therefore uh, you can adapt your uh, expectations. Um, and there have been uh, a number of empirical studies that show that people's expectations of the weather are weird. Um, and one particular uh, empirical regularity is that if people observe that it's snowing in their backyard, they drive or fly to the mountains to go skiing. Right, so it snows where I live, and therefore I assume that it snows in the mountains as well, and therefore it's good weather for skiing. And people have been doing this, uh, people have, different studies have found this, that people somehow don't look at the weather forecast of the place where they're going, but think that the weather is the same everywhere. Very, very peculiar. Um, but that doesn't matter a great deal, you just show up uh, at your favorite ski resort, it turns out that it did not snow there, uh, and you drive back home again. Um, <coughs> this is of course for the unplanned is for people in Milan, right, uh, or people who live near the Appalachians, uh, people in Boston and places like that, um, uh, who behave like that, not people in the UK, uh, because we have to book up like the plan long term uh, in advance. Um, th another thing that people have observed is that during hot days, the sales of open top cars goes up. This is again, completely bizarre behavior. Because the sun shines now, I'm gonna buy an open top car and drive it for the next five years when the sun may not shine. And this is of course a systematic investment, right? <laughs> it's just a fairly durable consumer good. Um, so these things matter and these things really influence behavior. Uh, and if people form the wrong expectation of the climate, in response to the weather, you can see a completely different uh, set of behaviors, right? So, for these reasons, I don't think, uh, and these are wonderful guys uh, who are uh, technically very skilled, I don't think this study uh, or any of the other weather studies tells us anything useful about uh, climate change at all. Uh, so that's why I excluded them. Okay, two more chapters, 20 more minutes. Um, <coughs> so far, I've been talking about the total impact of climate change. Um, but that is largely irrelevant, right? Um, what we should be focusing on is the marginal impact of climate change for uh, the, opt uh, the um, obvious reasons. Um, the first is, of course, as soon as you do an optimization, the first thing you do is take the first partial derivative, look at the first order conditions, and if you're interested in the marginal if you're looking for an optimum. Um, so that's the uh, technical reason. The intuitive reason is that, suppose you are elected prime minister of a medium-sized country like the UK, and you're in office for five years, hopefully shorter, um, you cannot solve the climate problem in that period, right? You can reduce the severity of the problem by a little bit, but you cannot solve it. Uh, so you're just not interested in taking away the whole of climate change. That simply is not something that any policy maker can ever do. Um, so therefore we are interested in what happens uh, at the margin. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about the marginal impact of emitting an additional ton of CO2. Uh, and of course, uh, this is uh, 
roughly equal to the pigou tax. It's exactly equal to the pigou tax if you evaluate the marginal damage cost along the optimal emission trajectory. Um, now, what I s and, and essentially the, the way you estimate this thing is what I explained in the seminar uh, in the computer lab last week is that you start with a scenario of emissions and you calculate climate change along that scenario and you calculate the impacts along that scenario then you slightly increase the number uh, or you slightly increase your emissions you reevaluate climate change or reevaluate the impacts uh, of climate change you take the difference between the two streams of impacts and you discount that back to today and then you normalize that by your uh, change in emissions right so that's how you do this um, technically uh, and people have done this because the marginal impact <coughs> is so important um, people have done this uh, and what I said um, about an hour ago is that there's 27 estimates of the total impact of climate change uh, but according to the latest count there is 2789 estimates of its first partial derivative the social cost of car um, now you may think that this is peculiar right that's two orders of magnitude for every impact estimate there is a hundred estimates of its derivative that cannot be right because we know how to derive things and um, the reason uh, is uh, that actually there's a lot more degrees of freedom um, <coughs> than uh, you may think um, so the first thing is that we have these 27 estimates here they are and you can just take this particular estimate fit the curve through that right uh, but you can also fit a quadratic uh, curve through that or an exponential curve right so for every impact estimate you can fit a great many curves um, so that is the first additional issue uh, that you introduce uh, the second thing is um, that what we're interested in is how the climate response to CO2 emissions and in the first week I showed you alternative projections of what the future climate may look like based on different physical representations of uh, the system right uh, similarly uh, you have different carbon cycle models where the atmospheric concentration of CO2 responds differently to emissions there's uncertainty there as well and people have modeled this in different ways um, <coughs> So far I've been talking about the total impact of climate change for the world average but of course there is a spatial pattern behind that that we'll talk about in two weeks um, there's a sectoral pattern uh, behind that that we won't talk about at all um, and different uh, studies may do this differently um, and then there's maybe completely different views and we'll come back to that uh, after Easter uh, on how to discount back to today or if you have different impacts on poor people than on rich people how do you aggregate across that um, and of course everything is very uncertain so we also have this multitude of possible futures and somehow we need to aggregate over those possible futures um, and different people have very different views uh, on these methods uh, and because of that you have that for every of these uh, impact estimates if you start combining all these degrees of freedom you easily get to a great many uh, estimates of the social cost of carbon first partial uh, derivative right um, so it's not because we don't know how to take the derivative and actually as a matter of fact most of these 27 estimates have never been used in a social cost calculation um, and it's actually typically the Nordhaus uh, estimate uh, that is being followed um, now 
good thing about uh, 2800 uh, estimates is that you can do uh, all sorts of fancy statistics and I won't bore you with all the things you can do. Um, but here is something that you can do, and this is a so-called kernel density estimate, where essentially what you do is you take all estimates and then you fit a probability density through it. Um, and you probably see normal distributions. Kernel densities allow you a lot more uh, flexibility on the actual uh, shape uh, of the distribution. <coughs> um, and gives you a much better feel of the uh, total. And uh, because there are so many estimates, you can also do sample splits without losing observations or while still having enough observations to do uh, fancy statistics. So according to the latest assessments, uh, for those studies that use a 5% discount rate, so the numbers that you see here, I'll come back to that uh, after Easter, is the pure rate of time preference, and in order to get to a discount rate, you need to add two to it. So if you assume a 5% discount rate, uh, you get the round curve uh, that you're looking at, which looks like a probability density function, right? So a weird one, uh, because it's skinned and it's right skewed, uh, but it looks like the probability uh, density function. <coughs> um, and it gives you an idea of uh, the most likely value, which is 35-ish. Uh, and it also gives you an idea of the uh, mean, uh, which is uh, 63, right? So when I talked about the total impact of climate change, I said that the uncertainty was right skewed that is negative surprises are more likely than positive surprises. That carries over into the social cost of carbon, right? So the average, the mean, is greater than the mode, right? That means the uh, density is right skewed. And you see that it indeed goes up very steeply on the low end, and then it slides down gently uh, at the bottom end. And if we use a 5% discount rate, then we would recommend the good tax of around $63 per ton of carbon. At the moment in the EU, the price of emissions rather last week. Uh, the price of emissions, I haven't put the price uh, this week, uh, is 96, right? So the EU is roughly in the, set, in the right order of magnitude. If we use a lower discount rate, three and a half percent. Two things happen, and then we're in the blue curve. One is that your expectation increases, right? And it increases rapidly. It goes to three hundred and eighty eight point six dollars per ton of carbon. <coughs> and the intuition here is very simple that the lower the discount rate, the more you care about the future, the more you care about the future, the more you care about climate change, and the more you care about climate change, the higher the carbon tax you would want to impose, right? Uh, so that is perfectly intuitive. And if, if you then go to a 2% discount rate, that's the green curve here, uh, the expectation of the social cost of carbon goes up again to 679 numbers, exact numbers are of course relevant, the order of magnitude uh, is important. Right? So this is a factor of 10, right? You go from 63 to 630. Um, <coughs> but there's another thing that happens, and that is that your standard deviation, given here uh, in brackets, also increases and increases rapidly, right? So for a 5% discount rate, your standard deviation is smaller than your mean, all is good, <laughs> some confidence in your numbers, um, whereas for a 2% discount rate it's actually greater, the standard deviation is greater than your mean. Um, the reason for that is that the discount, and, and you see it also in the curve here, right? so the brown curve looks like a probability density 
clinkers are really like it's almost a uniform distribution, right? Mm -hmm. It just doesn't change much if you go from zero to 500, and actually it goes to zero somewhere over there, right? <coughs> the reason for this is that the discount rate doesn't only discount your um, your values in the future, it also discounts the uncertainty of the future. So the lower the discount rate, the more the future matters. Right? But also the further you look into the future, the more uncertain things become. You have a fairly good idea of what's going to happen this afternoon. We have a decent idea of what the world will be like in 10 years' time. Well, a reasonable idea of what the world is going to be like in 10 years' time and uh, what our position in that world will be. Do we know much about the year 2100? No, really, right? It's very hard to imagine what the world uh, will be like then. But if you use a 5% discount rate, then whatever happens in the year 2100 is largely irrelevant. Because it's discounted away almost completely, including the enormous uncertainty about the year 2100. If you use a 2% discount rate, as Lord Stern uh, wants us to do, then what happens in the year 2100 matters, and matters quite a lot. And actually, if you've done the calculations, if you follow Lord Stern's advice, then what matters in the year 12,000 still matters for your estimate of the social cost of carbon. So if you go to <coughs> that low discount rate, then essentially you need to project the future 10,000 years? 10,000 years ago, we were hunter-gatherers, right? So what we will be like in 10,000 years from now is very hard to foresee, right? So the future becomes diffuse fairly rapidly, and if your discount rate is high, you ignore the diffuse, and if your discount rate is low, you have to take it into account, and that's why the uncertainty explodes um, as well. <coughs> I'm not going to do a uh, Sackhauser at all. Uh, so besides the 2700 uh, estimates of the social cost of carbon, there's also 650 estimates, 650, uh, estimates of its growth rate. Um, and you see another kernel density estimate uh, here, which suggests that the social cost of carbon should be 63 now. And then next year, it should be 63 times 1.02. And the year after, it should be 63 plus 1.02 to the power 2. Right? So it increases by 2% uh, per year. Uh, but also there, there's a fair amount of disagreement in the literature. People who say it should actually stay constant. And there's also people who say it should actually increase by 5% uh, per year. The central lesson is around the about. Two. Right? Okay, I've done it again, right? I uh, sort of said we're gonna, I'm gonna talk for one and a half hours and then we're gonna read that paper. And instead I've talked too much uh, and too slowly and now we don't have time to talk about the paper. Um, so what I suggest, unless you guys protest, is that on Thursday, we spend 25, 30 minutes on the computer exercise. I don't think we need that long. And then spend 25 minutes on the Viscusi Tsekhauser paper. Unless you want to talk about the exam. Again. So these papers, or these readings, have been on you for assessing them as well, aren't you? No. Oh because I know myself that chances are we won't fully discuss them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you uh, might take it. No, I, I, I mean, 
Uh, I don't really care, because you're perfectly right, they won't be assessed, so uh, they're under no obligation whatsoever. Um, so let me give you the four minute rundown on this Fiscusi uh, Tsekhaus uh, paper. Um, I talked about the impacts of climate change and how to measure that, right? And then from those impact estimates, we derived a social cost of carbon, which can be interpreted as a willingness to pay to avoid climate change at the margin. Um, now, there is an alternative school of thought, uh, started by these two gentlemen, <coughs> that says all this stuff is hugely complicated, hugely uncertain, Let's just estimate people's willingness to pay for climate policy. And forget about projections of future climate, forget about projections of future emissions, forget about projections of future impact. We're just going to ask people, how much are you willing to pay for uh, climate policy? Um, now, this is one of the first studies, it's also one of the best studies, I find. Uh, so I do suggest that you read it. Um, and what they this is a study for the USA, um, and it's from 2006. So Trump isn't there, but Bush is. Um, and what they find is um, interesting and intriguing stuff. So the, the most important finding is, and there's many studies that do this since is that people are willing to pay for climate policy. You ask people and it comes up time and time and time again in interviews and in surveys and in experiments. People are prepared to, in this case, the question is, would you pay? No, <laughs> that's not the question here. Um, the question is, would you pay more for gasoline in your car? And the answer is a resounding yes, if this were to help uh, climate change. Um, so that is the takeaway message, right? And as I said, this is the, so the uh, this is an increase. This is a carbon tax, right? Are U.S. citizens no? Are U.S. residents prepared to pay more uh, for the gasoline if that helps? Yes. yes, absolutely. Um, so yes, people are willing to pay for this. Um, and then there's also, because you do a survey, you not just want to estimate what it would mean, you also want to see does this vary, right? Uh, things such as gender uh, matter. What you see here is that people who think that the climate is warming faster than others um, are prepared to pay more. This is perfectly rational. Um, but then the projections, and that was the table I threw up before, the projections of is it going to warm more? Is it going to warm faster? It's not entirely rational. So people who think they run a higher risk of a heart attack also think that the climate is warming faster. Right? The two are unconnected, really. Um, I mean, your heart, the condition of your heart responds to the current weather, but not to the prediction of future weather. <laughs> really, it doesn't. Um, and of course, uh, such things as political leanings matter. People who intended to vote for George Bush the younger think that the climate is going to warm less than people who intended to vote for uh, Al Gore, right? Um, very people are law students. So people who uh, are not US citizens, but are US residents, have a different opinion than people who are. Um, and then, of course, the information that you give to them also matters, right? Um, so, 
this is an alternative method to get to the social cost of carbon, right? What is people willing to pay for climate policy? Um, and the robust result is yes, people are willing to pay, but we also typically find that people have very peculiar views on climate, uh, sort of their psychological makeup, uh, political leanings, all of those uh, matter uh, and matter quite a bit, right? So that is the paper. I think it's a good paper that you should read.